All right, so we've covered the sun, we've covered the inner planets, and now we're kind of moving past. There's actually an asteroid belt between the inner planets and the outer planets. So once we get past the asteroid belt, we start moving into the outer planets. Now, if you remember from one of our earlier lessons, you know, the outer planets are much larger, they're gaseous, and much, much more moons. So Jupiter is, you know, the king of the gods. If you remember your ancient Roman mythology, Jupiter, it's the largest of the planets. Jupiter was the king of the gods. It's actually more of a liquid than gas or solid. And so what I find most fascinating about it is the fact that it takes only six hours for a planet to size to rotate around once. It takes the Earth 24 hours. So what happens because of this is because it's rotating so fast, it actually kind of shrinks Jupiter. It, it like squishes it, as my son would say, it squishes it. And what happens is that the diameter around the equator is about 6% larger than the diameter going from the poles. And that's what happens when things spin. They start kind of compressing and start getting swished. So that's a circular momentum type thing with physics, but we don't need to go into worry about that at all. Volume is a thousand times out of the Earth. The mass is only about 300 big. So again, you can fit about a thousand Earths inside Jupiter. You know, some places say there are 28 moons. Some report there's 58. There's a lot. There's a lot with Jupiter. Now, some of the moons, Io and Europa, for example, are the size of our moon. But Ganymede and Callisto is, are the size of Mercury. They're, they're actually the size of other planets. Io, what's fascinating about that one, it's actually the most volcanic activity of any moon or planet. It only takes a couple months for the entire surface to get recovered. And the reason why it's so volcanic active is because it's torn between this constant gravitational tug of war between Jupiter and the sun. That red spot, it's a huge storm. And it's been going on for hundreds of years. Now Saturn, um, when you think of it, hopefully the first thing you think of is the rings. And that's the most prominent feature about Saturn is the ring system. But in actuality, a lot of the other planets also have rings. Density is less than that of water. There are several, you know, again, many moons, not as many as Jupiter. Jupiter actually has the most moons out of all the different planets. But the rings are only a few kilometers thick. So in this really confused ancient astronomers, because when you, again, looked at the telescopes, you know, they weren't all that good to begin with. They were able to make other planets. All of the other planets were round. But when they saw Saturn, they saw that shape of it's round and then the rings. But you, you couldn't have that nice, clean cut picture that you saw up there. So it was kind of a blurry, distorted. And then they were gone. And then it looked like a circle. And it looked that way for many years until, again, that blurry, you know, ring system came back but they didn't know it was rings they actually didn't know what it was they would see this thing be a circle and then it had ring and it had something coming out of it like bulging out in the middle then nothing there so really confusing to astronomers now first one first thing this is called uranus not uranus uranus it doesn't help that one it's methane gas which smells so when you tell your kids that they're going to bust up laughing and two just recently scientists are looking at some of that methane gas is escaping and leaking into space so uranus is actually leaking gas okay so it is up to you if you want to tell your students those pieces of information you know if you do you're not going to have them for probably a good five ten minutes after that now an interesting fact about uranus is actually tilted 98 degrees and so it rotates this way i think it might have been due to like some kind of major collision when it was forming. There's actually no internal heat source, unlike Saturn, unlike Jupiter. Uranus also has a lot of moons, and there is, again, a faint ring, faint ring system within Uranus. Now, Neptune was the god of the sea. It's a very blue planet. Again, all of the other planets larger than Earth. Because Neptune is so far away from the sun, and it does have an internal energy source, an internal heat source, Neptune will actually give off more thermal energy than what it takes in from the sun. Well, I find that kind of interesting. Now, there are several different moons around Neptune. Triton and Neerta are the two largest ones. Neerta takes actually a year to go around Neptune. So as long as it takes us to go around the sun, that's how long it takes this moon to go around Neptune. Triton, what's interesting is that it actually rotates opposite of Neptune's spin, which doesn't really happen. Everything kind of moves in single kind of clockwise direction all along the special thing, but 
Triton doesn't, which is kind of interesting. And again, Neptune does have a ring system. So, that brings us to Pluto. Now, I was taught Pluto was a planet. But you might have heard, like, well, no, Pluto's not a planet anymore. Well, we classify sometimes as a planet for historical reasons. Now, this is what really started, what was interesting with the debate with Pluto. It's technically not an inner, not an outer. It's smaller than all of the other planets, all of the other eight planets. It's the smallest one, and it's actually smaller than our moon. Now, Pluto's mostly rock with nitrogen ice, which is kind of what comets are made out of, but it's huge to be a comet. And there's actually one moon called Charon. Now, what's interesting is Pluto's what god? Well, Pluto's the god of the underworld, Hades. Now, there was a competition when Pluto's moon was discovered to come up with a name for Pluto's moon. And it was actually won by, uh, I don't know if she was elementary or middle school girl, but she came up with the name Karen. Now, if you're really good at your ancient mythologies, you might know who Karen was. Well, Pluto was the god of the underworld, also called Hades. Karen was the ferryman who transported the souls from the world of the living here on Earth to the world of the dead, to Hades' realm, to Pluto's world. So they, she came up with the name of Charon as the name of the uh, planet, or the moon of Pluto. So how was Pluto actually discovered? Well, like I told you in the last video, sometimes graduate students, doctoral students have kind of menial jobs. And what astronomers would do to look for planets is you have to first understand what does planet mean? If you look at the Latin definition of the Latin meaning of the word planet, it means wanderer. Now, the ancient Greeks were incredibly good astronomers. They would be able to look up at the nighttime sky and they would see that everything would rotate around Polaris or rotate around the North Star. And they knew that the stars moved. They knew that the sky moved. They knew that everything was moving in circular motion. But there were certain ones that didn't follow that rule. If I ask you, what's the difference between a planet and a star, looking up at them at the nighttime sky, if, now if you didn't know them, you didn't have memorized, there's no way to know the difference just by a single look between a planet and a star. So don't tell me that, you know, planets or stars twin from planets out. No, mm, we're not going there. The reason is that a planet moves across or wanders across that celestial background as opposed to the stars that are fixed on that place. Now, we have a, enough advanced technology, we can actually start to see the minute variations within the stars, but when you're talking, looking up at night with the human eye, you're not gonna be able to see those movements within the stars. We can, however, see how the planets move across the, scar, the stars at night, and that's how we know the difference between a planet and a star at night. So how do we discover them? Well, some of them we were able to see with our eyes, but Pluto was actually first predicted mathematically. We're not going to get into that. But I want you to look at these two pictures, if you want to blow up the screen, whatever. On the left is a picture of January 23rd, and on the right is a picture from January 29th in 1930. Somewhere on the left, you'll see a picture of Pluto in one location, and then somewhere on the right, you're going to see a picture, a little bright up of Pluto on the right in a different spot. Now, I want to point out that if you notice, like, let's look at those two bright stars close together towards the top in the middle. Though they look a little bit fuzzier on the left than what they do on the right, and that's just due to the exposure and the quality of the picture. So the picture on the left isn't as high of a quality as the picture on the right. So don't say like, oh, well, you know, they're farther apart, so that means it moved. No, it's just the exposure. It's just the quality of the picture. But I'm actually going to stop the video here, and I'm going to make you watch the next one and look at this one and try to figure out where Pluto is.